And uh, it's a horrific sight when something like that happens and there's there's nothing you can do. I let we we let the we let the the lambs get the you know nurse get colostrum, and then I I had to I, I had to sh- you know kill her right on the spot, and like it was it sucked, and uh and then you have to immediately I like immediately you have to jump in like okay how do I how do I bottle feed lambs now, like I've never done right. that before and like like immediately you have to get them in the barn and, and learn how to do that. This is the Farm Hop Life Podcast, a traveling homestead family. I'm Matt DeRosier. On the Farm Hop Life Podcast, we learn what it takes to grow your own food from everyday people. Could be a college student who grows tomatoes and salad greens on their apartment patio, a former VP of marketing for Del Taco now raising cattle in Montana, or someone who hasn't had a homestead in over 10 years. This show is aimed at teaching you what it takes to make homesteading work for you, that we all make mistakes, we all have bad days, but we can reach out and help one another thrive and giving you the confidence needed to go feed yourself. So your podcast, um, Deborah Gets Red Pilled, that's that, that's funny to me on multiple levels. My mother-in-law's name is also Deborah, And so some of the stuff that you talk about with her it like makes me cringe so hard because I would never talk about these things with my mother-in-law. Just like, yeah, we don't, we, we don't need to go there. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty lucky in that regard. I can talk to her about stuff that I like couldn't talk to my mom about, you know? So really you just have yeah. that kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. My mom isn't fun like her. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> so what, uh, F, obviously through, uh, through your wife, but like you, you like always had this, like they kind of started out this way, this relationship with your mother-in-law. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of a goofball and, um, you know, they're pretty, uh, they're, I, I've really lucked out with, uh, with the in-laws, you know, sorry, I've got a bad case of hiccups, man. So I'll try my best to work through it. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, I, I would normally be the kind of guy that would wait a long time to, meet a girl's parents or something like that. And I met them, uh, real early on. And, um, you know, the way that I look is, uh, somewhat off putting to, uh, parents of girls that you're dating. So, um, they never, uh, gave me any trouble, trouble or anything like that. And, uh, we're always just really, really kind to me and made me feel comfortable enough that I could like, you know, and I saw, um, my wife, em- Emily and, and, her relationship is kind of goofy. So, you know, I kind of joined it on that and was able to Good. just make my own little version of it. So nice. If you yeah. need to like t- take a time out and try to get rid of your hiccups. <laughs> no, they've been going like all day. I get them real bad. Some Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, we'll just tell everyone that you have Tourette's or something. You just have like a nervous. Sounds tick. good. I might, I might. So yeah. <laughs> You're in, you're in Oregon, the Portland area, it sounds like. Um, we're about an hour, ten minutes um northwest of Portland. Okay, so almost into Washington then. Yeah, I'm uh I live like the the next ta- the next town up has a bridge that goes to Washington and I'm farther north than a whole bunch of Washington is, actually. Because Oregon really? goes okay. up into like a little point at the north northwest corner. Sure. So, okay, yep. Yep, yeah. yep. So yeah, I'm like right on uh right in between Portland and Astoria, which is where the ocean starts, um, right along the Columbia River. Now I gotta look this up because we my wife and I, uh so she went to Portland State okay. and she loves going to like Cannon Beach and Yeah, yeah, Cannon Beach thing. is yeah, I'm 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 a little over an hour from there probably. Okay, gotcha. Um, sorry, I was just gonna look up. A, yeah, we're like we're like really halfway quick. between Portland and the coast. Okay, I do see. Yeah, I do see that. That it's like a little. Uh, yeah, if you see the town of Rainy, to town of Rainier, I'm by there. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah we're. Uh, we are in western Montana. Um, oh, cool. South of Missoula, so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we really like it. Yeah, I've only been up there uh, one time when I was on my big road trip, um, and uh, yeah, I loved it there. Loved that in northern Idaho, and it's fantastic. There was a question that came up 
you know, probably a couple months ago. It's like, if you can't live where you're living now, where would you go? And I think my answer was uh, Northern Idaho because it's pretty close to what I've got now. Yeah. Well, that's good, man. The, the, yeah. the winters you guys get are a lot different than ours. So the, um, you know, it gets kind of cold here, but nothing like what you guys probably get. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, you probably have a pretty mild winter just from the warmth of the ocean. I just, yeah. I mean, it's still, it gets in the twenties here. So, you know, we get a decent, not a ton of snow, but you know, a decent amount. So, so are you, are you from the, from that area then grew up there? I grew up in, in Portland proper until I was like 14. And then my family moved down to um, the Napa Valley, like an hour north of San Francisco. And I went to high school there and then went to college up in Northern California in Chico. And then um, spent, you know, from the time I was uh, graduated from college until I'd moved back to Oregon when I was 37. So I was down there from 14 till 37. So and then that- we, moved, we moved back to to uh, suburban Portland um in 2018 so it's so were you 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 homestead full-time right so like that's like your yeah you know, i'm uh i'm on my uh on my homestead full-time yeah i don't have a nine-to-five job my wife that's awesome biz, owns a business that does well enough to allow me to do that um but i don't want anybody to get that the impression that I'm like making money and that's why I'm able to stay home on the homestead. Like, uh, it's, it's not working out that way. <laughs> so, th- sorry, did you say what brought you back to Portland? Just, um, I always kind of felt like I was going to end up back in Oregon. Um, you know, my parents, they didn't really like have any, uh, um, roots here. And I always kind of felt like it was where I was from, even though I hadn't been back here in a, in a long time. Um, and, um, I just started having weird dreams about places from my childhood. Really? So I, uh, yeah. And, uh, I looked it up. I just looked up plane tickets one day on the internet and decided to come up for a weekend, came up by myself. And then, uh, it was like, I got like honey dicked, you know, it was like one of those weekends. It was like, um, late, april and it was like 80 degrees and beautiful the whole time which isn't isn't normal and i was like oh man this is fantastic you know and uh started just uh came back home didn't have any uh intentions of like leaving i was living in san francisco at the time in a one-bedroom apartment and uh, my wife was managing property and we were getting free rent and um you know we were just under the impression that we were never gonna be able to own a house living there. I had a good job. I was in the elevator constructors union making good money. And, uh, you know, we just, uh, knew that we were never going to be able to own a house in, uh, any place that we wanted to, we would have had to move like real far away from the Bay area, like, and, uh, lived out way out in the outer suburbs and, um, like in between San Francisco and Sacramento, we would have had to like go that far. Uh, just because it's so expensive there. And I just started messing around and looking at Redfin and Zillow and seeing what, what stuff went for in the Portland area. And I was like, wow, we could, we could do this. And, uh, luckily, um, my company, you know, it was a big international conglomerate they had a, they had a branch in Portland and I got on the, on the phone and talked to the superintendent up here and, and, uh, they said, come on up. And I just transferred unions and, and came up and started working and then, you know, so from that first uh, weekend of just coming up here by myself, like a month, a month and a half later, I was in an Airbnb um, working to establish residency in Oregon so I could get a mortgage. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, I was ready to get out of the Bay Area, man. So. <laughs> what was the, what was this, was it, um, so you kind of had a calling for Portland and... Yeah, I still wanted and to. You, uh, I still you liked it, li- so like, go I ahead. still enjoyed living in uh, in a like a urban setting at that time. You know, I, I would never had if it, it was I, more a love for the different place versus a hatred of the place you're at. It was both, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we ended up in this little uh, this little suburb called um, Milwaukee, and it's just like right across the the border from Portland, and uh, it's just kind of an extension of Southeast Portland, but it's. It's like 
it's in a different county, so you don't have to do a bunch of the stupid Portland taxes. And then um, it's, it had like a weird kind of creepy, eerie working class vibe to it. So what it's totally changed now, like because everybody's mm-hmm. leaving. Everybody wants to get out of the county that Portland's in, but still be close. So, um, yeah, I mean, we stayed there for three years, did minimal work on our house. I fixed up the backyard and got my first taste of like gardening and chickens back there. But, you know, we made a ton of money from just... We didn't, you know, we just, we just lived there for three years. So we got out at the right time. Can you talk more about your transition from your nine to five, got into gardening and chickens and then your full-time like into like a full-time homesteader now? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's weird. I still wake up every day and have like this feeling of of just immense gratefulness mixed with like kind of guilt that I get to do it, you know? And, um, really I'm incredibly lucky that I have a, a wife that's that, I mean, um, I hated my job so much and she, uh, she had the balls during, during the middle of the pandemic to start her own business and, uh, has done extremely well at it because she works so hard and she's like so good at what she does and she enjoys it. So that relieves the guilt a little bit on my end. But, um, yeah, I mean, I went to Catholic school, so I always have some weird kind of guilt stuff in my, in my brain. But, uh, yeah, it's just, um, it's like a dream come true. And then, you know, you're always, uh, we were thinking for, you know, the last, it was bad, you know, it was bad in Portland those, those three years. And, uh, like we had a beautiful house and a great life, but those, those three years in, in Portland were, were rough and, uh, wasn't what we were looking for as far as like the way we wanted to live or the people that we wanted to be around in that, in a, in a setting like that. And, um, you know, you're always telling yourself, like, if I get the next thing, like everything's going to be perfect. Um, we got out here and got land and, uh, got a house that needed a ton of work. And, uh, you know, you think like, Oh, I made it. I don't have to work anymore. I don't have to go to a nine to five anymore. Everything's going to be perfect, but it's still, it's still hard, man. It's still, uh, you wake up and, uh, with with anxiety and feelings of doubt and like you don't know what you're doing and all that stuff it's uh it's the same it's the same it's not not nearly as bad as i had when i had to go to go to my job but it's it's always still there you know it's it's uh nothing's ever perfect and nothing's ever gonna like even if you won the lottery you know your your problems wouldn't be fixed just because you've got money or whatever your life might be a little easier right. and a little more comfortable but you're still gonna have that same that same thing going on in your head yeah but um is that what you wanted um yes that's want... exactly what i wanted okay. i was just i was just gonna say so my so my uh my wife took the kids to go visit family for a week before because we're, we're from minnesota we she went to go visit her family and then i came about a week later and during one of those saturdays i like you know was working outside and like just you know could just get to work it's what I wanted to do, but like at the end of the day, I'm like, man, I got my ass kicked. Like I just, you know, this went right, but like there's all this other things that like didn't go right. You know, this looks good, but this looks like crap. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's how I mean, it goes every day. Sometimes, um, sometimes I work the whole day, and then at the end of the day, what I was working on the whole day didn't work. You know, or it's worse right. than it was. You know, and like yeah, like man, days. I can't say what I actually did today. Yeah, 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 and those days too sometimes i just kind of like wander around and like i do i do stuff but emily comes home in the evening she's like what'd you do today i was like i don't even know and then uh you know it gets it gets hard here in the the you know like i said it's not montana cold here but there's no sun here man it's uh like it's pretty cool when you live in the bay area you get like a sneaky week in the middle of january where it's like 75 degrees the whole week or something like that Sure. that's not here man like we if if i can get a couple hours of sun in on a day and there's no and like the ground's actually dry um you know i'm out on the back porch like without with my shirt off like getting as much of it as i can because it's uh it gets it gets dark and gray and wet and cold here man and it stays that way for nine months so getting stuff done outside in like you know anytime from december through the end of March is, is an undertaking. It's like changing clothes constantly and, you know, putting on rain gear, taking it off, changing your socks, you know, getting holes in your boots. And like, this is uh Northwest Oregon is where like 
rubber boots come to die. I've tried five different brands so far. Really? Years. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, and none of them have worked so far, or helped. Um, I I I get I get like a year out of them, so some less some less. I got I got two weeks out of chore boots once, you know. So. Is that what they got mock, or, uh, on my muck, uh, oh, muck boots though. The yeah, ones. I I bought some of those and I got I got they might have been a, a counterfeits because I got them for cheap off Amazon, but I got like two weeks out of those <laughs> until they like just oh, broke at the yeah. seams. Now I'm like wearing Dang, these, dude. Uh, these generic ones called uh, Hycia. They sell them on Amazon, mm. and uh, they work they work fine. So I'm on year like three or four of my muck boots. Yeah, I don't have to wear them a lot. I just wear them. Often, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, it's like an all day, every day thing out here in the in the winter time. You know, I believe that. Yeah, I, dude. So we're probably at like the same like uh, latitude or longitude, whatever. Which one's what? Yeah. Um, and but like obviously you're at way more humid, and I I can't deal with all the wet. Like, yeah, I I, I like it dry. I I yeah. If I if I got wet socks all the time, I'm I'm gonna be mad. Yeah, like uh, it'll like when it snows here, it gets it'll we'll get like some cold snaps where it's down in the teens and twenties for the whole week. That's pretty cold for here, and it'll be like dry, and it's like man, I I would so much rather get out here and be feeding pigs and like frozen frozen mud instead of like six inch six inch uh, mud and like a slight drizzle and thirty four degrees, you know, for all day. Right. Long. So yeah. So. So you moved to your new property, mm-hmm. and did you did you bring anything with you? Any of your chickens or anything like that? Yeah, we had um, we had seven chickens, and um, our neighbors, our next door neighbors in Milwaukee, had five that they didn't want anymore. I can't remember mm-hmm. why, and they gave them to us. So we came out here with uh, 12, 12 chickens, and um, you know that was it. Uh, our dogs, our uh, our three dogs, and um, you know, and a garage full of tools and stuff like that and uh yeah and uh our house was in was in bad shape when we got here you know the people were were i think could i think it could have been an episode of hoarders the way that they, like oh, the, oh i'll send you um if you send me your uh your uh phone number or something i'll send you the the original um rmls photos from like the listing and man it's okay. crazy like the what they thought was appropriate to put like on Redfin, but um yeah our house it's was, like one of those like Zillow gone wild kind of it would have been on I never saw like, that you know, I've never, yeah it was uh yeah it was in it was in rough shape there was there was barely a functional kitchen here we could kind of cook um and uh you know there was no uh there's no central heat um there was like this rickety old um pellet pellet stove that didn't work and uh we put in a we put in a new wood stove we thought that was going to do it for the whole house and it it didn't work and then like we uh took all our money that we made selling our old house and um right in the middle of winter started started gutting our kitchen and remodeling it so like sometimes we had like exposed walls for like for like a few days at a time and i was still working i was having to drive to portland every morning i, I would wake up in the morning and it would we had an old thermostat for some reason in the house, even though there was no central heat or air. But the, I remember I, w- I got up one morning and the thermostat was like 34 degrees in the house. So holy smokes, yeah. And um, yeah, it's weird. Like uh, Emily and I talk about that sometimes, and uh, we can re- I can remember it happening, but I don't. You know, it seems like so long ago, and it wasn't even that much. But we got we got uh. We got heat now, so it's pretty nice. What was the what's the heating solution now? We got a whole system, whole new ducting system, and uh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, we got we have a basement, so we got like a whole new furnace and ducts and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, we still got the the wood stove, but I uh, it it'll only do like one room, you know, and won't get back to the bedroom and stuff like that. Sure, I've heard I my grandparents had a wood stove or have a wood stove still, but. I, I was I was too little when I was around more to understand like how it works. But I've, what I've heard is like the wood stove really is only good for the room that it's in. 
mm-hmm. and like how it works it kind of like siphons heat from the other rooms i guess so like the yeah. other rooms are actually colder i don't know if that's true yeah i mean i i haven't heard that but it sure felt like that when you'd leave that room mm-hmm. and have to go get in bed and like, you know get in the bedroom and there's no heat and stuff in there but yeah hmm. yeah i don't yeah that's kind of kind of weird so so remind me uh what year did you guys move out to your new place it got we got under the homestead um two years ago okay so 21 um nice. like the middle of august of 21 nice yeah so then so you had your you had your chickens and i'm sure i'm sure like very soon like you built out your garden start growing some out growing some we didn't we didn't get uh anything in the ground the first year first uh first year we just had too much going on i mean this place was filled with uh garbage you know um just just tons of gar it had been really uh neglected for you know the past 30 years and so it was just uh pulling Clean up to the trash yeah. like finding finding buried garbage and like overgrown grass area i'd, I'd just come to like a lump but there'd be like a hump in the grass over by the barn and there uh, there would be like you know 500 pounds of like waterlogged particle board like buried in the ground you know that it holy smokes. And just just stuff like that all over the place and out here that people just buried buried their garbage or burned it so there's like burn piles with like tons of like tin foil and plastic and stuff in them that i'm fine i still find it it comes out the rain pushes it up so um wow. yeah no didn't get a garden the first year got one this year didn't do that great um i'm not a huge green thumb right now um as soon as i was able to quit my job started looking for uh mammals livestock um we decided to do sheep um first and um yeah we got our original three sh- uh, we got two sheep we got a, a weather which is a castrated male and a um and a female that they thought was a male but found out that it was a pregnant female when they were like bringing it over to our house so we were excited about that so um and she gave birth you know a month or so after uh they got out here so that was our that was pretty quick little, yeah that was our original uh little flock of three and um just built it out from there so we have um we have 13 now that's so, a lot yeah it's getting nice there. so yeah. you've have you brought in rams for your does it's no yeah, it's not I, i'm sorry it's used yeah, I bought um we bought a we bought a ram from our um neighbor, our next door neighbor, which is like a quarter mile down the road. And um so he's a big uh a big katahdin, which are hair they're hair sheep, so they don't have wool, which is if you're not I'm I'm not trying to, to breed wool sheep. So um these these guys are, are really cool. They're they're from uh, Maine, but they they do really well in climates like wet climates like Oregon, and they're um, sheep are hard to keep alive. They uh, get parasites yeah, real yeah. bad, and uh, it, because of the how wet it is here, the parasites in the in the ground are um, it's it's I think it's just because they get they get pushed up with the water, and then they kind of just like fester in like standing water, and then the, the sheep will be out there eating grass and stuff so it's so it's um the katahdins are more um parasite resistant like their their hooves are supposedly um better for for being wet all the time and stuff like that so um we've got a bunch of those a bunch that are mixed and uh yeah but eventually like if i want to keep doing it with sheep which i do um i'd like to have all all katahdins what i've the other thing i've heard with um well, there's a couple of things with hair sheep versus wool sheep in a wet climate like yours. The wool doesn't, uh, doesn't like breathe. And so yeah. like w- if it were to rain a lot, it could just trap all that moisture. And then I think that causes something like fly strike or something in sheep. And so like their back is just like, have you ever seen like those bot fly videos where there's like parasites? Yeah. Those are really skin? gross, man. 
Yeah, those, yeah. Those I, have, I don't know. I haven't heard anything like that, and I haven't had any uh, problem with my with my uh, with my wool sheep. And um, a lot of people out here do have wool sheep, so um, I, maybe maybe that is an issue. It hasn't been uh, hasn't been for us. Sorry, I, th- I thought the Katahdins were hair. Are they hair? Yeah, I they are hair. I have a ton okay. of sheep. I've okay. got a bunch. Of oh, too. I see. I so, see. Yeah, um, I've got I've got um, mostly uh, mixes. I we went out. We bought we bought our uh, we bought a ram, and then we bought some um, some like half Katahdin, and half uh, East Frisian, which are dairy sheep, and um, have, we've and then we've bred everybody. So we had uh, this last spring we had a full like lambing season. So the have you tried meat from both yet, like the hair sheep and the wool sheep? So far, we've only done it from uh, we've only had wool. What we've we've killed, we slaughtered one the the first um, ewe that we got that was pregnant. We ate the little ram that she had last winter. Gotcha. So I he was, was a, he was a wool sheep. I, I was curious if you noticed anything. Well, I guess you don't you don't have anything to compare to with the flavor. But when we were looking at getting sheep. We, we move pretty slow here. We're very, um, we, I, it might be a little bit analysis paralysis, but yeah. Um, so we were looking at what to, what to get and we tried, uh, some katata meat. Yeah. Uh, man, that's, that's pretty good, but man, that is a really strong lamb flavor. And the guy we got it from, it was like, really wasn't like, fatty like good it was like fatty bad i don't know how to describe it was he feeding so you, i did some did research feed you a uh, mutton or what i don't that's, know that's that's a big no- thing too man is is how old it is because if you're eating mm-hmm. anything that's over one year old it's i don't remember it's considered mutton and that's like the uh, or like, like fatty the grizzly gamey stuff that could be it that could be it i yeah. did i've heard i've heard so i did some more research Go ahead. I've heard everybody that I've said or uh, talked to, and and you know, you look on I look on Craigslist farm and garden all the time. Um, mm-hmm. People claim that the Katahdin meat's like the most mild of the lamb meat. Really? Yeah. Hmm. We had went with we we ended up buying uh, sheep to get processed. It was uh, oh shoot, it was a soa s o a y. It's mm-hmm. another hair hair breed, and with the hair breed, they don't have. It's like way less lanolin that gets yeah. in the meat, so it's got like a way. It's like lower lamb flavor, so it's like a mild lamb flavor, like you're talking about. And my wife yeah. is like, "This is this is awesome. We need to have this like all the time." Yeah, yeah. I went to a um, a pig butchering uh, seminar this summer, and. Um... The guy that was doing it said that even uh, older, older ewes are to him way better than, like, uh, than lamb. So I don't know. I'm gonna have to start checking it out. We've got four little rams that I'm gonna process this fall, and um, yeah, I can let you know then. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. So you're what? For, let's let's take a one big step back. I, okay. I, uh, I'm looking back at my questions. When you got your chickens and you had your, your garden just outside of Portland there, what motivated you to start with, start there? Um, I guess, um, you know, everybody was kind of, it was during the pandemic. Everybody was kind of operating out of, out of, uh, fear and um i thought you know i got to start figuring some stuff out i got to you know maybe do as much as i can in this little spot and start having a garden um i had a big backyard and it was just kind of what i was wanted to do i made it like really nice back there and built raised beds i was like okay so i got to put plants in them um it's easy to grow stuff here I, I, the garden there was really really successful and um you know, I thought about getting chickens early on and then just heard like dumb stories that people said like, oh, if you get chickens, you'll get bed bugs and stuff like that. So I never did it. And then, um, yeah, just dumb stuff that never, I believe, you know, you know, I mean, we did get, ro- you do get rodents from them. We did at that place. Um, we mm-hmm. don't have any, any more because we have cats, but, 
Um, but, uh, yeah, my wife just said one day that she wanted to get, get chickens and I was like, all for it. So, um, I built, we had a good, really good spot for a little chicken run and got a coop and built some stuff back there for them. And yeah, started right away. She was, um, she was, um, out of work the whole time. She, she might've been down to one day a week or whatever, you know, cause her business she was working at shut down. And, um, so she had time and she really, uh, started doing the, the chickens all by herself. Um, I helped out a little bit, but she, and built all the stuff, but she did all the, all the, um, you know, taking care of them when they were little chicks and, and doing all that stuff. So, um, and then, uh, you know, just, I just wanted to do stuff for myself. And I don't know what, there was probably some sort of statute in that town of like, that said you could have three chickens or something like that. We got eight or five right out of the gate. I just wanted to, I just, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to be more self-sufficient, just, you know, start, start small. And, and, um, that's what we did. And eventually we went on and got, I got meat birds and did them in that backyard. And, um, that was like just a straight up F you to like the, the, the government, you know, it's like, okay, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this back here, I, but I'm going to do it. So I, I think I was just messing around on YouTube and I saw a Joel Salton, um, seminar where he like was processing chickens and I was like, oh man, I could, I could do that. And, uh, yeah, I did it. I'll never raise Cornish cross hens again though. They're super gross, man. In my, they're pretty gross. Yeah. They're very I, gross. You know, uh, they got super big and um, I didn't think they tasted all that great. Um, if we do it again, I would definitely get a different breed. So, sure. but it was yeah, cool. I mean, I mean, it was a, you know, it was a eighth of an acre backyard and I raised meat birds in it. So it was pretty cool. You do a lot more, like, sounds like you did a lot more with the eighth of an acre than a lot of people do on five, 10 acres. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it goes to waste. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the garden was, was great there. It was, it was easy growing stuff in, uh, in, in raised beds and it did really well. And yeah. So yeah, that was that. Your, your setup now. So you've got your chickens, you've got your sheep, you've got some pigs. It sounds like you've got sheep and pigs to process this fall. The pigs might uh, take a little bit longer. I have um, these little, uh, I have these little lard pigs. They're called um, American guinea hogs. That's so, like a classic pig, isn't it? Like it's kind of like yeah. a classic homestead pig, right? Yeah, they are the ultimate homestead pig. They take a really long time to get to up to the right weight, which sucks. Mm. It's like eighteen months. So, mm. um, okay, but they're they're old. They're a really cool old breed. Um, Thomas Jefferson had them and they thought that they, that they, like, if you were like a colonial American, like everybody had a pig. Um, and that's, that's what they would have had. And they were, they're lard pigs. Um, so back in the day, like before there was like industrial, like lubricants, they wanted a pig that had a big old fat cap on it because they could use that, that fat to make oil for like lamps and for machinery and, and stuff like yeah. that. And then, um, it, they're really good for curing. I don't know if they were doing a lot of that back then, maybe, but, um, I know, um, they're, uh, the fat pigs are, the lard pigs are good for, for making, uh, ham and prosciutto and bacon and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, we got those guys. Um, they thought they were extinct and then some guy, they found some at some guy's farm in like Georgia and then they slowly started bringing them back and spreading them out through America. And we got them from these guys um, out by Mount Hood. And they were like the first people west of the Mississippi to to have them. Wow. Around. So. Wow. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. So they're all uh, ours are we could we could get them registered if we want to. I think I, I, I should because so, then I could sell like their piglets as registered piglets, you know. But um. But they're pretty cool. We bought just like uh we bought a breeding pair. My wife was driving home from work. We lived like on a windy, you know, um pretty rural area. So we live on like a windy road and she was just driving home one day and these little cooney cooney pigs like waddled out into the road 
and she like stopped and they came like right up to her car and she like petted them and stuff and i'd wanted pigs for a while and she came she like came in she was so excited she's like told me the story she's like we got to go get pigs should i should i like go back to those people's house and and see if they have any extras because they had piglets and i was like all right let's wait and do a little research and i found these guys on you know like i said craigslist farm and garden that's where you'll meet the best people in the world like really yep. cool people that i've met on there and uh found these guys um it's two guys married couple <laughs> out out by mount hood and they're just out there like guy was like a professional makeup artist in for like broadway in new york city and he just like gave it all up and like homesteads out by mount hood in oregon now has uh has dexter cows and guinea hogs it's like pretty cool dude i want to interview that dude yeah um i'll send you his information and uh and um yeah went out there and uh like a lot of times you go out to these people's farms to get animals or livestock or equipment or something and you'll end up like being there for like two or three hours you know just talking with the people and they'll always say you know call us with any questions and stuff like that and i have multiple multiple people like that and i made friends from there and stuff so um yeah i got the got the guinea hog got a just a young breeding pair from him they were pre-breeding age they were like probably four months old when we got them and then uh had piglets you know at the very start of last spring so it might have still been the the tail end of winter um their their gestation's pretty short like less than four months and um luckily we got a small litter because it was her first litter um got six piglets four boys and two girls and uh yeah trying to keep pigs in is is a whole whole other story man it's it's uh if you're trying to do it on the fly and just like build some stuff that's gonna work it's not gonna work you gotta like engineer some stuff and uh yeah so i got some some nice pig pens built out there and like some pretty good sized runs for them and stuff that they can't with with um hog panels and cattle panels and stuff like that so but for a while there man we just had like six little piglets running around the yard like i'd I'd go try to put like away. free range yeah just free range they're supposed to be um they're supposed to be pasture pigs but man i they you you got to move them like constantly or just like not care about your pasture because they're gonna tear it up and start rooting and big digging big old holes like real fast like the people that that have them on pasture move them like five times a day and uh these when the little piglets are small they're not they're not big enough to like start really doing a bunch of damage so then we i finally got like um five of them five out of the six like in a in a pen and then one would always just escape so it's like all right well i guess she's the she's the yard pig we named her uh we named her Houdini and uh because she escapes from everywhere. But um yeah, I got some good pens built now and everybody's all in there. I'm gonna I'm gonna I got one pen for the for the sow, one pen for the boar, and then I'm gonna build on to it another run tomorrow for like for the feeder pigs that we're gonna have that we have and that we're gonna have in the future. And they I built like gates on all of them so I can like put the the two that I want to breed together and stuff like that. I have little rooms and little different corrals, you know. Do you have where do you post pictures for all this stuff? I do have an Instagram. Um so yeah, I post uh pictures sometimes. Um mostly it's just like my wife playing with uh our dog our big guardian dogs. But um our our homestead is called Rising Tide Homestead. So if you go to Instagram okay. um and just look that up, one word rising tide homestead, um that's what it is. Okay. Amazing tide. Right I wrote that down for later. Yeah. Um yeah, because I didn't see I was trying to figure out how to see more of like homestead content versus red pilling content. Yeah. Like so They're but I got up. Yeah, that's okay. It's it, yeah. it's my it's one of my probably uh it's a good niche, right? Conspiracy yeah. and uh homesteading. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, yeah, I, uh, it's nice, man. Um, I took a break from the show, like a three month break this summer and just worked on the farm after I, 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 uh, 
I lost it. And uh, last uh, last spring was, I know you said you kind of wanted to get into that. Last yeah, spring was just chaotic and hectic. And, um, you know, it was our, our first real spring of like everything was happening. It was all happening. Um, we had, you know, a whole bunch of uh, pregnant sheep and um, lambs being born. And uh, the little piglets had been born. And it's, you know, it's all muddy and it's still like, it'll be nice and it'll snow and then it'll get muddy again. And it's just so much stuff going on at once. And like, you know, it's an old homestead. So like, so, the, you know, the well won't be working or I'll have to figure out how to, how to do some other thing on the fly. And then one, one of the sheep will start giving birth. Yeah. And, um, yeah, by the end of it, um, we were watching, we, uh, we had taken on two of our neighbors, um, sheep. They didn't, they didn't think they were going to have enough hay to, uh, to get through the winter. So they said, if you guys take these two sheep, take care of them, you can breed them however you want, keep the lambs and then we'll just get them back at the end of the summer, you know? So we did that. And, um, you know, I, I screwed up and, uh, I broke, I fell on one of the, I was trying to catch one of the, she had just given birth. I was trying to catch her, get them into the barn so they would stay in there so that, that the little lambs would be safer. And something I didn't even need to do. And uh, I fell on her leg and snapped one of her back legs, you know, like high up, you know, up above her, like what would be the knee, which is a bad spot. You know, usually if it breaks down low, underneath the bend it can kind of be just like splinted and it'll grow back and maybe they'll have a limp or something but without um like professional veterinary care um it's just uh it's just a write-off you know it's a loss and um our neighbor didn't want us to take it to the vet for some reason um so we didn't and we just kind of taped her leg up and let her get to the point where the sheep were her little lambs were uh we kept them in the barn we get to the point where they were old enough to be weaned and then we we put her down i put her down you know and it was tough um but when when that happened when her when her leg broke i i had a little mental break i I snapped you know and it's just it was uh kind of the the straw that broke my back man It, it was just like a real stressful time. And then that happened and it was just, it was just hard. I've got, it's hard, man. I've got, you know, 40 years of like animals or pets built into me. And when stuff like that happens, even if, you know, even if these livestock are, you know, purposely here to give me food or, or some sort of resource, I still, I still really love them all. Of course. And, um, and, uh, you know, um, before that, at the start of the spring, um, one of my little, I had a little, these little, uh, East Frisian lambs that two of them, they were like my favorite, uh, and they were, I got them both, uh, pregnant and I didn't get them pregnant. I bred them with other sheep to get, <laughs> for so they, they could have, uh, little lambs. And, um, one of them just gave birth. Um, I just went out there one day and you know, how it's supposed to be. I went out there and there's two new baby lambs. Um, so I was like, okay, the other one's about ready to go. And, um, you know, she, uh, she had a rough birth and, um, ended up uh, as a long story. I don't really want to tell the whole story. It's, but, uh, you know, we pulled her, we pulled the sheep out. She gave birth to two like beautiful little, little, um, half Katahdin, three quarters Katahdin, quarter East Frisian lambs, um, a girl and a boy. And, uh, like her, her, her uterus prolapsed, like right out of the, right afterwards. It's just my favorite one. And, uh, it's a horrific sight when something like that happens and there's, there's nothing you can do. I let, we, we let the, we let the, the lambs get the, you know, nurse get colostrum. And then I, I had to, I I had to, you know, kill her right on the spot. And like, it was, it sucked. And, uh, and then you have to immediately, I like immediately have to jump in like, okay, how do I, how do I bottle feed lambs now? Like I've never done that before. And like, like immediately have to get them in the barn and learn how to do that. And, uh, it's just stuff like that over and over and over again. And then by the time, uh, 
this little lamb broke her leg and uh yeah it was rough and um you know i at, at that point i was just like you know i don't i don't really care about like the rothschilds or the masons right now i don't really need to be looking at this <laughs> i don't care about any any uh conspiracies or anything right now i just got to get take care of business out here have a mental break and not have to be like worried about um doing a podcast every day and like coming in early and researching and trying to book guests and doing all this stuff my numbers had been way down anyways and i wasn't really feeling it and um i was like i'm gonna take the summer off from this i'm gonna work on the podcast i'm gonna read books um you know stuff that i want to read i'm gonna read fiction and uh it was uh it was really nice man it it brought my mental health back to uh to a pretty good baseline i don't know how deep you go man but um I, you know, just taking that three months off from doing that and then getting back in and like jumping feet first back into it with people that haven't taken breaks for the past 30 years. It's like, ah, uh, I don't know. I don't want to be, I don't want to be like that. I want to be uh, someone that can, can research up to a point where it's fun and I'm like doing it because it's enjoyable to me and it's just yeah. kind of like my hobby. But I, you know, I, I've looked into the eyes of people that are, paranoid and not operating in reality anymore and it's sure i've seen that i've seen that recently and it's pretty scary to me and um and then just like even if you know i i I know what's going on i know it's i know it's all messed up but like it's that uh i think it was uh bill hicks the comedian who used to tell his joke like he'd watch the news and like the libya is blowing up and all this crazy stuff's happening out and then he just like open the blinds and look out his window and it's like everything looks okay out there. And it's like I'm not watching if I'm not stuck on Twitter all day or watching Fox News or or Tucker Carlson, like I'm just out on my I'm 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 digging post holes the old fashioned way on my on my homestead. And there's yeah. there's not much else going on but that. And if it comes down to it and you know, something happens and I'd, if I if I had a countdown to like the end, I'd I'd go out and I'd dig post holes tomorrow. Man, like that's what right. I do. So yeah, yeah. I actually did a conspiracy podcast with some friends from high school. We did like thirty episodes, and they kind of like didn't feel like doing it anymore. I'm like, well, I'm not going to do this by myself. Like we did this together, type of thing. So we just like stopped doing that, and um, I was still like. I still have like an interest and whatnot, but lately it seems like, like you were talking about people that, you know, are paranoid. Like, yeah, it's, I'm super annoyed by most conspiracy people now. Cause like everything's a psyop, like nothing is real. We live in yeah. a simulation, like all like, look, just give it a rest. Like, let's just, you know, like that whole touch grass thing. Like you should probably yeah. do that. Like try that. Yeah. And, um, like I said, I'll, I'll you know, I, I'm able to revert to like a Christian worldview at this point as well. And like, that just kind of takes a, a lot of the, the thinking and worrying out of it for me too. So that really you works. Such, I'm glad you brought that up. You're such a unique character and that like, you're like, you go really deep into conspiracies and, um, and you also like, you were recently, oh man. I think you were. You said you were recently baptized, or maybe I was listening to an older episode. But yeah, I got I got baptized uh, last last uh, Easter. Wow! So, yeah. like, how do you, how do you? I mean, that's like a big balance. So, like, I mean, so like, does your does your faith keep you keep you afloat in like like your faith in your homestead keep you afloat in like looking at like how messed up things are everywhere. Imagine, imagine, I don't know what, what your, what your spiritual uh, life is looking like now, but if you, I'm I grew just, up Catholic and okay, me too. I, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming back around. Okay. Let's, let's um, say it, let's put it that way. I just, I think like, man, if I had to look into all this super dark stuff and think that like when I die, it's just going to be the, the lights are out. Like right. what's the, what's the point? Like, Mm-hmm. man ah uh, that that would suck so bad for me and um you know i i got here because i i kept digging down into those holes and like 
I mean, I could drive an hour, an hour to the east of here, and I can see pure evil on the, on the street as soon as I get into the town, man. And I, I, I know that there's there's got to be the the inverse of that. And um, it's just uh, yeah, I grew up I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. Um, and uh, I knew I didn't want any part of that. And um, you know, I I, did, I ended up at the Eastern Orthodox Church. You know, first press Christianity is was what it is. It's the uh, it's the original. And um, you know, it's uh, I I I just uh, I went I walked into a church in in Southeast Portland. And uh, I felt the presence of of Christ like immediately, and uh, I, you know, been been going back ever since. So, so, but um, yeah, that faith, that faith of just like, whatever happens, happens, and it's gonna be okay, is is immense for me. You, so it must be part of like the um, Orthodox part where like so i heard you talk about fasting during lent Mm -hmm. and like do you think that part is important to actually have like a fulfilling faith instead of like this kind of like dabbling like oh i'll go to church on sunday but you know as long as you're as long as you're like home for for the football game you know yeah right that that you have to immerse like you as much as like maybe you don't want to do it, like you have to immerse yourself in the traditions in order to get the maximum out. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. And it's like, I can't, I can't do the, the record. What's, what's the real Orthodox Eastern Orthodox fast is, is vegan for a month. And I can't, I can't do it. Um, but it's, um, you know, you talk with with your spiritual father, and you you work out a plan. You know, he's not expecting guys that are like hardcore working class dudes or me, like working on a farm or something like that. Um, you know, the who who can't I, I I can't eat. I don't do well with uh with wheat. You know, so I can't mm-hmm. just sit there and eat like pasta and spaghetti sauce. I can't. Eat, I don't do well with like legumes. You know, I just go tell him that. I I ground beef for a month, man, for forty days. Sucked. <laughs> it sucked. Yeah, I mean it was good ground beef. It was ground beef from the cow that's in the freezer in my basement. You know, it wasn't from the store, but still, you know, by the end, I had a couple of ribeyes in there too. You know, but yeah, it's just uh, going through the process and the sacrifice. I mean, it's still a sacrifice, and um, and uh, yeah, doing it. I I do have the we have a prayer rule. So I pray every morning and, and, uh, every night. And I, I don't want to do it. If I do it and I feel better, it's like going to the gym, you know, it's like, I never, I do jujitsu. I never want to go to the gym. I've, and I've never felt bad walking out of the gym after I've done it when I didn't want to. Right. You know? Sure. So, no, I think that's, that's important as like, there's, like this might seem like off topic, but I think a lot of there's a lot of crossover now. People can read into that however they want. Like you know, you know, you're tending to God's green earth or wh- whatever, whatever you want to say about it. But you know, there's there's a lot of crossover, and so like there's a lot of different people and their various journeys, myself included, um, with their faith, and so. That's, yeah, I, I like that you talk about that aspect on your podcast. It's pretty cool. Yes, uh, thanks for bringing. Yeah, I it's uh it's one of those things. It's like um a new toy, and it's hard to, uh, when you figure when you find out to not like try to like just go vomit it all over everybody and like tell everybody about it and how great it is. And, 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 and I found out like really quick, especially in the conspiracy community, which I thought would be like super open minded about it. So like oh, no. oh, people people <laughs> people don't want to hear it, you know, sure. and um. And then, like, I'm I'm not equipped to have like theological arguments with people, and, like, so everybody's all the different sects are gonna you know argue with you about what's right, what's wrong. Well, what about this? This is like, I don't know. If for me, it, well, there's people you know I'm not I'm not Jay Dyer. I'm I'm not a, I didn't go to I don't have a master's degree in theology. Like, I went in I I know a little bit because I was I grew up Catholic. 
I could follow along with an Orthodox liturgy because it's kind of the same. Um, so I know I knew what was going on. Um, you, you talked to my, my wife went to one and she's never been in a Christian church in her life and she couldn't get out of there fast, you know? So, um, she's, she's not that quite there yet. I mean, hopefully someday she will be, but, um, yeah, for me, it was, uh, it was heart, it was heart, not head. So. Sure. And, but uh, I, I really like that, the, like what you share, like, it's not that it's, it's not strictly this or that. It's like a good variety. Um, you just get a lot, like it gets a good, like a good sense of like who Adam is. So. Right on. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. You should check it out. There's some really cool, uh, monasteries, Eastern Orthodox monasteries up by uh, your neck of the woods. I, uh, yeah, we're good. We should definitely uh, exchange numbers so you can tell me about those. Because I heard about your, uh, you also talked about um, going to that monastery out by Reading or something like that. Yeah. We're like, yeah, the, talked um, for like a, almost a week or something. I was just there for a couple of days and we talked, but it's just like minimal. I'm, I'm, I'm good at not talking because I'm out here by myself most of the time. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a monastic way. Like I said in that episode, a monastic way of life is not. Uh, something that's for me at this point in my life, you know. Right. And uh, it took. It's still. Uh, I have. I have tremendous respect for the people that can do it. Um, I couldn't do it right now. It's, uh, sure. It's definitely a calling. It'd be something that would be very, very hard to fake. Right. Oh, uh, it is. I. Uh... It was a. It was a beautiful experience, and I'm. I'm really glad that I got to do it. And. Uh, Anybody that's like starting their journey into into orthodoxy can go visit. You can go visit the the monasteries by where you live, and it's uh, it's it's a really cool experience. So, trying to trying to go back. I don't know how to yeah, yeah. transition it well. <laughs> We're just gonna go for it. Yeah. So, so what's do you think the headspace? That you so you took you took a couple months off from pretty much everything other than homesteading. Mm -hmm. um, do you think getting getting uh, your headspace back was that been the biggest challenge in homesteading so far? I mean, the biggest challenge in homesteading for me has just been that it's uh, it doesn't. There's no days off. It's it doesn't end. You always got to get up. You know, my wife has Tuesday and Wednesday. Off. So I could take it a little bit easy, but I still got to get up at seven in the morning and go, go feed pigs and, and do all that stuff. Um, I think just the biggest challenge has been trying not to get overwhelmed and trying, it's just trying to, you know, I'm sure you watch plenty of homestead YouTube and I watched all that stuff before I left the suburbs and then like all these people have these beautiful like justin Rhodes. you know you go look at like that guy's house it's like this beautiful manicured farm and all this stuff like that and it's uh you know if you're anything like me and you're an old working class dude who you know saved money and and was able to get a little house and then upgrade to a farm or whatever you're not getting that you're not i got 16 acres here and the reason i was able to get it is because uh because it was a pile of pile of shit you know like <laughs> That's that's why we were able to afford. But I mean, it's a beautiful area, and just the, uh, you know, it's it's really rewarding. Um, I found an old video that my wife and I filmed, like when we brought our first load of stuff out here, like before we'd moved in, and uh, it's wild. It's uh, it's so amazing what what's happened here, and um, yeah, I mean, just the. Uh, the hardest part is just keeping your head on straight, like knowing it's not, it's never going to be done. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be problems and just like being okay with that, getting to the point where you're okay with that, I guess is what I'm trying to say is that that's hard. It's hard for a guy like me, you know, who's wants everything to be done and, and right and perfect and stuff. So I, I am also tired of the never ending list. Like I'll get to start something. Cause I'm like, I want to build this thing, but then like, cause I'll get, I get started on it and I get tired of working on it. So then I get, I go and start something else. Yeah. 
and I get tired of working on that. So I'm going to start something else. And then I'm like, like at some point I got to come back to that first thing and just like head down, push through it, get it done. And that for me yeah. this year was like this giant rock wall that yeah. goes from the front of the house, down the side of the house to the like walkout basement. So like it goes down the hill and it's like, I don't know. I think I calculated it. It was something like a hundred cubic feet of rock. No, wow. it, I don't I'll remember. It is a lot of rock. So like, yeah, we, that, that's what I have here. And so like, that's what I use for material. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's pretty cool here. Like, I I think I'm finally out, uh, ran out of T posts, but for like the first two years, I just found, I, was, I just used T posts that I found in the bushes. Like, I just, I'd be like, oh, I need T posts. I'll go look behind over in the bushes, over in the blackberries. I'll find some. So I, nice. think I, I think I finally used them all. But yeah, and it's also like, just get to that point where you're like, okay, that thing, that fence is okay for now. It'd be way better if I like, cut all the old rusty barbed wire out and like pulled a whole hundred yards more and stretched it all and did it all right. But it's like, no, it's not falling down yet. It's still working. It's keeping cheap in, go do the thing that needs to be done. So you don't get a pregnant pig that's given birth to 18 piglets when you're having a hard time taking care of the six that are there right now, you know, like yeah, just uh prior prioritizing on the fly. It's just, uh, it's just chaos. You know, it's always going to be chaos. You got kids running around too. Do you? I do. I've got yeah. a three year old and a one year old. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine trying to do what I do now and stay cool with like, I, you know, I, I pray every day to like, tr- that I can treat my wife correctly. You know, I do, but I have to pray, <laughs> pray for it because I don't want to like blow up and snap on people. If I, you know, as much as I want little children running around here, like having the, a one-year-old and a three-year-old while trying to do what I do every day, man. Good on you, bro. <laughs> uh, that's probably half of why we move very slow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's all in good time, right? You gotta, you gotta. It's not a, it's not a one-year plan. It's like a thirty-year plan, right? Yeah, I mean, we're not trying to flip this place. Like, we want, we want to be here forever. We're gonna, it's yeah. a little, it's a thousand square foot house, man. We're gonna, we're gonna make it work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not the, uh, war in the middle East where you have 20 consecutive one year wars. It's yeah. got to think a little bit long-term than that. I, I go to war every day, man. <laughs> oh, nice. There you yeah. go. Yeah. No, but, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. If it, people wanted to, you know, get used to going on, uh, maybe a one, one, two day vacation every year, you know, you might get that if you're, if you're lucky, man. So, this year we went out to that uh, we went out to that homesteading uh, conference out in Coeur d'Alene, so close to you, man. It was really cool. You should uh, check it out next year. It's called Modern uh, Modern Homesteading. Oh man, was that you said it was north of Coeur d'Alene? It was right at the cor- uh, fairgrounds, right in Coeur d'Alene. Oh okay, I think I might have looked at that one, but yeah, I yeah. did. I I've been meaning to go to some sort of like either a workshop or conference or like anything like just to meet other people and like shake hands and yeah like i said man craigslist farm and garden you ever get you ever buy like uh livestock off somebody um you just say hey you know when when you're ready to butcher the your, your next run of pigs can i come over and, and help or something like that and just like learn yeah. about that you know and uh, like the lady I got, it was really cool. The lady I got my first sheep from, she was o- across the river in Washington. Um, I had um, I had I had texted these people about some uh, I can't they had pigs or sheep on Craigslist. I texted them, and um, made some plans that never really worked out. And then um, we signed up for Azure Standard. Are you familiar with that? I heard of so them. We, yeah. Yeah. So we went to pick up. I went to pick up my uh my order over in over across the river in Washington. And, um, it turned out the lady I had been texting with was the, was the lady who runs the Azure pickup. So, oh, nice. and, the, and yeah, now we're like, we've been to her house for, we went to her house. That's where I butchered my lamb. We went to her house for a hog butchering seminar. Um, and yeah, so it's really cool to like be able to make connections like that. And it's really, really uh awesome in the in the homestead community and i'm sure like up by where you live there's a whole bunch of 
young people that are that are getting back to it and then finding those people that there's old old timers too that'll that'll help you out most of them want to spray pesticides and do weird stuff like that and stuff that isn't congruent with what we want to do but a lot a lot of those old guys have a lot of a ton of knowledge you know yeah yeah i'm finding more and more i think you need to spend time in the place it's not it's not instant you're not just gonna like hey in six i mean unless you've made it like your number one priority maybe in six months you could meet 50 other like homesteaders and stuff but um i mean if you got you got your own stuff to do too yeah so how long have you guys been out at your place we finished building march of 2020 Cool. So we right like, in time, man, right in time. Huh? I know, I know. Jeez. Yeah, it was uh you, you got out of you got out of Minnesota. I know you probably we weren't in Minneapolis, but I'm sure Montana's better than Minnesota. my wife was actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, uh I was she moved out from her, her mom's place. I moved out from my parents' place in the suburb and we had moved to Missoula back in twenty 17 and we're in apartments and had been looking for land here and there and this came up from a co-worker of hers when she was uh back when she was working and yeah it was under underpriced and so we like jumped on it heck yeah man yeah and uh you're talking about talking about butchering i was gonna ask if what about what time do you think like what time of the year do you think you're going to be butchering your sheep? Fall is tradition. So okay. that's, you kind of, you kind of, that's why people want to do like spring lambs. You have spring lambs. And then traditionally the, the boys and the girls that you aren't going to keep are ready to go by the fall. Cause I and, could uh, definitely talk my wife into coming out to Oregon and uh, helping out with some lamb butchering. Oh, dude, let's 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 stay in contact, man. And I'd, yeah. I'd love to have anybody out here. I'm gonna have. To, I'm gonna, and it's it's rad. The guy that I bought one of my rams from said he'll come down and uh, pay it forward and like sure. walk us through everything. You know, I'm I, I gotta I be like a deer, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a ruminant. So you got it. You know, for um, anything that's got like multiple stomachs, like goat, sheep, um deer the it's bad like you can't do it in the heat you got to get that mm. you got to get it cooled down so november here is is perfect for it you know and everybody has either a shack or you hang it in the shop for a week after you after it's all skinned up and stuff um i watched a guy do a hog butchering seminar that was incredible at that homesteading conference in in Coeur d'Alene, 85 degree heat and uh no rush at all no no problem so pigs wow. can pigs can be any time of year as long as you got a place to a refrigerated place to hang them overnight but he took right it was, it was a three-hour seminar every day first first day he, he dispatched it he just went out in the parking lot and uh it was in a livestock trailer killed it they brought it in a trailer he scraped he dunked it in warm water scraped it he didn't skin it which is way more awesome um because you get all the fat and uh and then at the end of the first day, he had it, you know, he had it cut in half and everything taken out of it. And then the second day, he butchered it and, uh, uh, you know, cut it all up, cut the cut one half into uh, into stuff to cure, and then cut like everything else up for into cuts. And it was rad because he did it for like homesteading. You know, he's like sure. His uh, if you ever check him out, his name is uh, Brandon Sheard. And his Instagram is, uh, or his whole like website, and everything is Farmstead Meat Smith. And um, he has these really cool videos. You can find them on YouTube called The Economy of Thrift. And I really recommend, I think there are like three or four parts to them. I recommend they're like 20 minutes a piece. Everybody should go watch those. They're really cool. And uh, yeah, just like when we went out to, um, when, when we went out there, like the pigs were just running around crazy and I was having a hard time with them. I was like, I don't know if I want to do pigs. I went to that two day seminar. I was like, it got me like pumped up to do it, you know, to like, yeah, it seemed like it was an accessible thing that anybody can do. 
on the homestead. You know, the stuff I'd seen prior was like guys doing it with a mobile butcher truck who weren't like trying to teach people. They're just like, we just showed up and like watch this guy like kill a pig and, and cut it up super fast, like um, with industrial equipment. And this guy, this guy used a cool, let me just get my $50,000 commercial kitchen. Yeah. 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 He had like a, he had like a band saw that was like on hinges, you know, like a gigantic sawzall that like came down on hinges. And so I was like, yeah, you know, maybe or not. So, uh, Don't, don't cut meat with the sawzall <laughs> a gigantic port of band that came down but um yeah this guy uh up that i saw at the at the conference he um used a 22 long rifle to to put it down or a 22 magnum um that's what you need for pigs and then he had mm-hmm. he had he had one knife one knife and a bone saw and i think that's all he used i see that yeah, yeah. And to butcher it and to do everything. One knife and a bone saw and a and a hair scraper. It's pretty cool. So nice. So those those connections, would you say like that's the best part about the home about homesteading? Connecting with other people? Yeah. Um, no, I think the best for me, I'm a introvert, man. The best part of homesteading is just being out here and um, you know, getting to do whatever I want with the, with this little piece of land. Um, and just, uh, you know, bringing it back to, uh, this was a working farm at some point in the fifties, you know, and I'm just bringing it back and, and taking, taking control over as much of my life as I can, as far as like food and stuff goes. And, uh, we're trying to have kids, you know, we want to have a bunch of little wild homeschool children running around and at least one, you know, and, um, just, uh, kind of, opting out as much as as much as we can and and uh, I I don't have any any uh crazy idea that I'm going to be off the grid or self-sufficient or anything like that. My goal, my lifelong goal for being out here is that I have to go to the grocery store once a month, you know. I think and I think that's an attainable goal and um sure. you know, I think a lot of people come out. My neighbors came out here. My neighbors have 120 acres. They're young, younger than us. They came out here a little bit before we did. I think they had a uh, had the idea that they were gonna make money up homesteading, and it didn't work out. You know, I don't, I don't think I think if you're coming out here with the intent of like leaving everything behind because you're gonna have enough, you're gonna figure out a business to do with homesteading. I think uh, I think you're in for a, a rude awakening, and um, you know, uh, I think the fact that I don't have to do this for a living to make, to make it work is what makes it work. So the, um, that would be a lot of added stress. Like it already, it already seems pretty stressful. Yeah. And then like, I have to make this work. I mean like, yeah, that could like light a fire under your ass and like that type of thing. But man, the, not everybody can operate under that kind of pressure all the time. Like think of, think of, say you wanted to sell somehow you figured out you could sell pork on the gray market. You don't have to do like the whole like industrial kitchen thing. You could raise some pigs out here and sell it to people um, under the table. And um, just, um, and you move out to a place that doesn't have any infrastructure for that. You don't have pigs. Imagine like you're that's, that's a two year process, you know, to get all that started and thousands and thousands of dollars in, in infrastructure getting, getting pens set up and figuring out how to do it and animals dying and all this stuff that you don't even know how to do. And yeah, that's the stuff that like drives people mad and makes, makes uh, people quit. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's just frustrating. Fed up. If, if you're, um, if you're not able to quit your nine to five job and you, but you can make it out and get, get the hell out of the city for sure. But, um, you know, just take it incrementally and, in small steps and uh do what you can do at the time and um yeah that's that's my uh my main advice to people i appreciate that yeah yeah that was that was that was my nice question so perfect is there is there anything else that uh you didn't quite cover that you're like hey a little bit more on on this or i think we hit it all man i'm pretty happy i think i think so uh, I will uh, let people know if they wanted to hear more about your 
so like you your podcast we uh, we we talked about it in the beginning deborah gets red pill deborah's your mother-in-law mm-hmm. you had um episode one i had to look it up really quick i listened to it this morning it was 185 hard days on the homestead that's where you go into details about um what happened this spring with the lambs and um yeah everything there's a lot more detail uh, yeah i recorded i recorded that, that one at like five in the morning because i couldn't i couldn't sleep man so i just like got up and was like all right i'll throw out i'll throw out a show you know so yeah but yeah that's i'll uh i'll have a link for that you have a let, let's let's go through a couple of social media things. So you've got your Twitter. That's how I found you. I don't even know how I actually found you because the first one I listened to was like you giving a like a recap on Ruby Ridge. I'm like, oh, cool. Like, oh yeah, listen about Ruby Ridge. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna do. But some I don't know how I found that. Yeah. Um, but, I'm gonna uh, do some more of that. But um, you want my social media? We're on yeah. Um, we're on Twitter at uh, Deborah gets red pilled. We have an Instagram, just Deborah gets red pilled. Um, my personal Instagram or our homestead Instagram is, um, rising tide homestead. And then, uh, yeah, the podcast Deborah gets red pilled is available on all, all the podcatchers and stuff. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, Deborah gets red pilled at protonmail.com. That's the, that's the, uh, email I return every email. So it's such a funny name. That's a great <laughs> name. Well, Adam, I really appreciate your time tonight. And uh, we're deaf. I'm right after this. I'm texting you my, uh, I'm going to send you a message, DM you a message with my number. So, hell yeah, man. Um, because, thanks, Matt. Yeah. I really, uh, I really enjoyed this. This is a good talk. And uh, anything I can do to help you guys or help the show, um, let me know. I'm always down to uh, come on and talk, talk homesteading. Uh, we'll get you on our show sometime too if you want to talk conspiracies or anything like that too. I think I'd really like that. Cool, Thanks. man. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do some more. Uh, that that Ruby Ridge one was on some other guy's show. I just put it out on my feed. I'm, uh, I am got a I got a pretty good book I'm going to read, and I'll do an episode. Maybe we'll have you on for that one. Yeah, considering I'm, I, I kind of know about it, but I don't know, like, the details um, or, like, that that thorough anyways. But yeah, I wish they did, like, man. that Waco. <laughs> I wish they did that Waco show, but yeah. Ruby Ridge. Like, they touched, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they touched on it right at the beginning, and then... It was, yeah. They do a really, really poor version of like showing what happened there. But um, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah stay in contact, and uh, yeah, you're always you're always welcome if you ever need to come out into uh, Northwest Oregon. Man. I'm gonna make an excuse. Right on. All right. We'll meet. See you, Adam. Thanks, Matt. See you, dude. I am Matt DeRosier of Farm Hop Life. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and visit farmhoplife.com. Inside of the city, the people are crazy. Out of their minds, they ain't got a clue. We gone away, headed west for Montana. Left family and friends, all I got now is you. We both got new jobs, a host and a homestead, thinking this was the life, all that there'd be. After our firstborn, you had to stay home. That's when the work got in the way for me. Well, I started farm hop life. You'll come to your farm to help and to want. Me and the family, a truck and an RV, send us a message and there.